Hi, I'm Bob Darty. At Bank of America, we believe that every citizen should be informed about the important issues affecting their lives and their communities. That's why we're proud to support the Caucus Educational Corporation and its production of One on One with Steve Adubato at the Newark Museum, a groundbreaking series that will feature some of the very best artistic talent that New Jersey has to offer. We hope you enjoy the series. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at Newark Museum has been provided by Bank of America, life's better when we're connected. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. The Fidelco Group, Johnson & Johnson. Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department. And by Barnabas Health, life is better healthy. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to the beautiful Newark Museum. One on one at the, uh, from the Newark Museum, we are honored to have back with us our good friend Junius Williams, who is the chair of Newark Celebration 350, 350 years here. Uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Newark's been around that long, but he has so much more than that. He is an activist, he is a scholar, he is a published author many times over, and is a great friend of public broadcasting. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. Um, by the way, what does this place represent, the Newark Museum? Oh, this place represents a lot of triumphs for me. Uh, my first time uh, coming here was when it had just been rehabilitated, my group came here, my singing group came, returned to the source. Your singing uh, group? Uh-huh. See, I left that out. You didn't put that in there. Okay. Hey, hey, Renaissance man, I just should have said Renaissance man. What's the story with all the different things that you have been accomplished at? Why, why? arts, culture, scholarly works, politics, ran from there. Is it because you just love to be engaged? There's a common denominator, and that is, I believe in organization. And all the things that I've done with, I've, 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 I've sorted this through. I mean, the singing is not by myself, it's with a group. Uh, I ran for mayor, as you said, but I had a political uh, small p history being with the, the Newark Area Planning Association and our fight with the medical school and the medical school you agreements. You run a leadership group at Rutgers called? I do, the, the Abbott Leadership Institute. So all of that's bringing people together to do something that they didn't possibly think they could do before. Bringing people together. Tougher these days? Yes. Yes, because there's been a mind game played on America and uh, do we have time for all of this? I mean, is, is, I don't talk about Newark. <laughs> by the way, tell, by the way, tell everyone, because we'll talk more about mm -hmm. Newark Celebration 350. Uh -huh. Tell us what that is, and then we'll talk bigger picture philosophical oh, okay. stuff. Okay. Well, the, the Newark Celebration 350 is a continuing series of events and happenings to celebrate the history of Newark, but also the present of Newark, and to make it clear that we are a city that's going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's something for everybody. We're in the wards, we're downtown. Uh, we received about 224 proposals and we funded about 150 of them. And it's not all from the top. It's not all just a single set of events that are gonna take place downtown, which are gonna be good. We have mm -hmm. some of those. But we went out into the wards. I made sure that we had ward meetings. Into in the all fives, into the neighborhood. And where did the dollars had, come from? The dollars come from uh, foundations, from corporations, from individual donors. And the mayor's involved. The mayor's very much involved. We're we couldn't do it right without there, the mayor. Baraka, yeah. We couldn't do it without the mayor. What I mean, does that mean? Can't he, do it well, him. he's made the city uh, available to us. We have there's certain kinds of permissions that you need. He's he's made that easier. There's there's certain places we want to go. He's made that easy. He's made some of his staff available to us. Mm. What's your sense of Newark at, in the year 2016? 
What do you think? I, I know huge, big picture. We've had, mm -hmm. we, last time we had you on was at uh, NJIT, a great mm -hmm. institution as well. Um, and your, your book had come out, um, Unfinished Agenda. Yes, very much so. So much more to talk about. Uh, Reader's Digest version. Where do you think we are right now? Newark is right there. Where? Newark is right there on the cusp. And that's one of the things we want to make sure that folks understand. Uh, we have a golden opportunity to make people know that this is not the city that was advertised during the rebellion. The rebellion 1967. The 1967 rebellion, which still holds in some people's mind. Uh, Newark has an opportunity to show that despite the fact that we have a large number of low-income people and poor people, certifiably poor, if you will, that uh, with, with, a, with a dynamic mayor, we can do something about that. Uh, Newark has an opportunity to show that a downtown community, which, which includes a lot of communities, uh, that people want to do something that's going to put the, put the shine on something more than just Broad Street. Mm. So I'm saying it's right there. It's on the cusp. Is it more diverse? Is, is the city... Is Newark more diverse than it was 10, 15 years ago? Oh, sure. <clears throat> How so? Uh, a lot of immigrants, people coming from not, well, 50 years ago when I came in to Newark, the immigration was coming from the south to the north, and it was mostly black people. South to the north, also Puerto Ricans. Now you've got immigrants coming in from all over the place. I just saw my wife showed me a, a statistic this morning. Uh, most of the people coming from the South are coming from Haiti. And you've got the Dominican Republic. You've got Peru. Who knew Peru would mm. have a lot of people coming in? Uh, from, so you, you've got a, another element of uh, people coming in who don't speak English and therefore whose uh, demands upon the system are different. And the question is, and this is one of those right there kind of questions, what are we going to do, for example, at Barringer High School, where you've got... One of the public who, high schools here in the city. One of the public high schools in the city, where you have several different foreign languages spoken as the native language, but you find cutbacks in the funds. You don't have those, those people who are able to transition kids from so one English, language sorry, to another. So, so English as a second language becomes very important. Transition, ability, tradition, those things are very important. By okay. the way, the, the 350 celebration... How much will you incorporate all of these different, diverse folks into the celebration? If they came to us and asked us to do something mm. and it looked like it could be done, we said yes, because everybody deserves a, a, a right, as mm. the old folks used to say, to the tree of life. So we're, we're going to make it possible. The public school, or let, let me just put it this way, the educational environment, the educational challenges, the educational opportunities, mm -hmm. always a huge part of the mosaic here in the city. Where are we? We don't have enough money in our public schools. We have a, a governor who has made sure that uh, they keep the lid on taxes. But what that means is that a lot of poor kids don't have what they need. We were just talking about the English as a second language mm. kids. They're also kids who, have, uh, who are harder to educate because they come to school with issues. So you, you talk about keeping a lid on mm -hmm. taxes. I believe you're talking about state dollars to the city. Yes. State so, dollars for education have been cut. So, so devil's advocate, if those who would, uh, who would respond to that, Junius, would say, hey, wait a minute, mm -hmm. the dollars spent per pupil in the city of Newark, comparatively, I mean, compare that to other communities, it's much higher. So how much more are we talking about of state tax dollars from others in suburban wealthier communities would we be talking about? And when is enough enough? Some would argue that, you would say. Well, first of all, compared to what? When you said that they are higher. Uh, the Abbott case said that the amount of money spent on pupils in Newark and Camden and mm. places like that should be as high as that is, that is which is spent in the I and J districts, which okay, are the richer you're, districts. Uh, you're referring to, a, I don't want to get too arcane here, you're mm. referring to a historic and important Supreme Court case that the uh, New Jersey State Supreme Court right. determined that right. children in certain mm. districts um, 
originally Abbott versus Burke, I believe mm -hmm. 28 school districts. 31. 30, well, okay, it's expanded. Mm -hmm. It has. No, it was over expanded. Okay. But now it's, it's, it's irrelevant. Irrelevant because? Because it, was, because it was cut out. The Abbott program was killed in 2008. I use it as a benchmark. Meaning the money wasn't there. The money was cut back because a new law was put into place under Governor Corzine. Then the next year, in 2009, Governor Christie said, well, we're going to even cut back more. What did it mean? When that happened, what did it mean? Well, it meant that you lose For these children, in it, your opinion. It meant that you lose teachers, you lose social workers, you lose counselors, you lose librarians, you lose books. A lot of the kids in Newark now have substitute teachers. One of the kids in my youth program said, now we have substitutes for the substitutes. Mm. because they don't have full-term teachers, and that's obviously a problem. A um, whole other debate on charter schools will continue in, in another discussion. Economic development opportunities in the city. We've talked to a lot of developers, a lot of people involved in investing in the downtown. Mm -hmm. Some good, positive things happening in that way, no? Yes. yes. What could it mean for the city in the next five to ten years? Well, we hope it means jobs. We hope it means not just jobs, but what kind uh, of jobs? economic opportunity for people to become businessmen and women who are, are ordinarily thought of that way. Mm. Uh, th there are certain sectors in the population uh, that are very much in need of job training, job development. We hope that's what it means. So we can only be hopeful on that. Do you believe, <coughs> excuse me, Junius, that the, those who are bullish, <coughs> excuse me, on the high tech part of this, that Newark can be a hub for high-tech activity comparable to what has happened in Brooklyn, which has been a real boon for, for Brooklyn. You say what to that? I mean, Don Katz and others who, Audible, I mean, he's with the Audible team, they've done significant things. Mm -hmm. You say what about that? Well, NJIT is training a That's lot right. of good people. Don Katz is looking for a lot of good people. But That's the right. question is, where are the Newarkers who are coming through the pipeline, which gets back to our discussion on education? They have to be trained for, they have to be they prepared have, for that. And they have to have equipment. And that's where we get back mm. to the example of Barringer, where a lot of, of the computers, public the public high schools, the computers are old, and most cases they don't work. And they don't have high speed mm. internet. So how are you gonna bring that section of the population to those high tech jobs? Junis, you've seen a, f a fair number of things in your uh, 50 years mm -hmm. in the city? 50 years living and or working in Newark. So you're a Newarker. You're committed to the city. You're known in the city. You're respected in so many ways, in so many circles. You remain optimistic, but you have never been shy about pointing out what you perceive to be the problems and what you believe the solutions are. Mm -hmm. Overall, optimistic. Optimistic. Because? Because I see the young people in my program, the Youth Media Symposium, who we're training to become leaders, teaching them that they are capable of having a voice, that their voice is worth listening to, and if they learn the skills associated with the media, doing things like you do on camera, but also off camera like this gentleman is right. doing, they will become, they will, they will have a voice that people have to listen to. Mm. And I'm listening to them right now. I mean, I had a young lady speaking to the, to the, uh, the Senate Budget Committee yesterday, and she was uh, amazing, <laughs> the way she projected herself. Now, this is a young lady that came from the Dominican Republic three years ago who didn't speak English, who is now at the top of her class at that same school, Barringer. But she's saying, I don't see that we're getting what we deserve here. How proud of her were you? How proud were you of her when she was up there doing that before the Senate? I wanted committee? to hug her before she finished. And when she got down, Senator Teresa Rudis came yeah. up and hugged her. Everybody yeah. was so happy that she did what she was doing. Is it hard for people to understand why a Newark kid who comes from the Dominican Republic gets up before a legislative committee and does that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big deal for any young person, mm -hmm. but it's particularly a big deal for a kid overcoming all kinds of obstacles and challenges, yes, right? Yes, yes, because uh, uh, and this is a controversial statement, but I believe schools, public schools, charter schools, do very little to help kids to become the leaders that they can. And you include charter schools in well, that? I include that as well. We have charter school kids in our program as well. 
and they're very shy and very reticent. They know very little about politics. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do personally is to talk to them about this election that's coming up. The presidential. The presidential election. And there, there, there's no emphasis placed on what we used to call social studies. There's no real emphasis on history. And the history that's talk, that they're taught is so bottomed out, it's so mm. basic. You know, Martin Luther King was a great man because he was a, a soldier for peace and love. I mean, come what would on. You, what would you take? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, to, I'm not afraid, but I'm concerned about opening up this huge Pandora's box. But if I said to you, as a scholar, as an academic, as a teacher, uh -huh. as a leader of these young people, say, and we're doing this in the, in the spring of 2016, just for argument's sake, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in the fall are the candidates, you know. What do you think the message of that campaign would be for those students to take away and say, this is what I learned about the political process? Mm, well, you see, Hillary Clinton, I think, has to make more of a statement to these young people because she's not firing okay. it up. Donald Trump is meeting that burden, but with another section of kids. I don't mm. think our kids, we don't have to worry about our kids listening to Donald Trump. But the question is, can Hillary Clinton turn them on enough, those are the 18, to come out and if she and doesn't, Trump, Trump? And he doesn't? Well, and they just say, I pass? If they, is they, that good enough? That's not good. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I, I have, I have, I'm optimistic because I'm teaching kids not to be those kids who just opt out. That's not an option. That's not an option. Before I let you go, a Newark Celebration 350, tell everybody why it's so exciting. It's exciting because this is a victory lap for Newark, and people are seeing it as that. I haven't heard a bad word about it because people have an opportunity to get involved. We, we could have had just one or two big events downtown, but we spread out into all five wards and we're letting people express themselves to pick their own heroes and sheroes, to pick the events that they think are good and everybody seems to be happy. We try to uh, pick a, a small snippet of what we do. We, sir, we call it one-on-one -on -one and one. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Give me a great sound bite, you ready? Ready. Describe the future of the city of Newark in uh, one minute or less. Young people are going to take over and change the whole paradigm dynamically. How? Because they're going to see things that we don't see, and they're going to make sure they get it. We at the leadership, uh, the, the, the leadership development that I'm doing with people is making people see that, that, that two plus two doesn't always have to equal four. Sometimes it can equal five, but you have to go out and make it happen. And you remain optimistic. I, that's why I remain optimistic. Thank you, Junius. Thank you. In the uh, spirit of uh, the great Dr. Clement Price, who was a mentor to all of us, we continue our work. Yes. Thank you, Junius. Thank you for helping us. You got it. Stay with us. We're right back from the Newark Museum, one-on-one, -on -one, right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Oh, you're going to love this segment. We're joined by uh, two very interesting young ladies, uh, Lorene Williamson and Pamela Thomas. They're their co-curators of the Museum of Uncut Funk. By the way, that has to be, I've been doing this for 25 years, that's got to be the coolest name of a museum, uh, of Uncut Funk. What does that mean? Uh, it means that we celebrate uh, 1970s black culture. Uh, we are stuck in the 70s. We're huge fans <laughs> of everything <laughs> that's happened in the 70s, whether it's the music, the fashion, what was going on on television. We're just still there. So hold on. It starts as an, as an online museum? Yeah, it's a virtual museum that celebrates 70s black culture and all of the really cool icons that made the decade so special. Um, it also features our very interesting collection of uh, artifacts from the 70s, um, from animation art that features black characters to movie posters to <laughs> coins that have uh, black people uh, featured on them. I mean, it's just a really eclectic uh, 
grouping of things that we've uh, become obsessed with over the years and put together as a collection. And now we are curating sure. parts of our collection and turning it into exhibitions that are traveling to museums across the country. Let's do this. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Jackie Robinson um, whole collection and the Marianne Anderson. Anderson collection. Wait, Mary Anderson, Anderson, Mary Anderson, Anderson, Anderson coin, coin. Can we just do this? Um, Georgia, help me on this. Can we show some of the other visuals? You could talk us through them. Sure. Okay. Some of the animation. Sure. That is Fat Albert. That's Fat Albert. Yes, Fat Super Albert, Globe Muhammad Cutters. Ali. Fat Albert was, that was Bill Cosby's voice. Yes. He did several other voices in the Fat Albert series, yes. right? Yes. He did Mush Mouth. He did Mush Mouth. I believe he, he did, did Bill. Bill. And there were other uh, voice actors that Weird did the Harold. other characters in the, in the gang. Talk about Jackson 5, because I assumed, incorrectly, of course, as we're looking at the Jackson 5, I said, of course, it was a Jackson 5. It was their voices. You said no. No, they sang their songs, but there were other actors who did their voices. Yeah, I thought they were actually inside the television singing when I was a kid. <laughs> I had, you know, I just knew they, that they were there. But it was their uh, music, It was not their, their music. Right. Um, it was uh, actually Motown's first television uh, series that was produced by them. Hold on, so Barry Gordy, Barry Gordy he was drove involved. that? He was involved yes. in that, yes. Absolutely. He saw what they a brilliant. Everything. He saw the potential. Yeah. Yeah. What was the describe the market? Because I'm sitting there going, I'm sitting there as a kid in Newark watching it. Mm -hmm. Who was the market? Well the market was us. I yeah. mean we are the, the generation that generation. was raised on these cartoons and, and they were up. really the first boy band you could say huge, that yeah. was as popular as they were. And for him to have the insight to create this animated series. It was just mind blowing. So we are that generation. We are those children. Yeah. Who so it wasn't it. purely race driven. It was for everybody, but disproportionately yeah. for African Americans. Well, the interesting enough, I mean, back in the '70s, this is before cable. There were only like three major networks, so everybody watched the same cartoons. So that's right. You'd watch either, you know, your ABC, your NBC, your CBS, or maybe you mixed them up because sure. you were kind of changing channels, and you'd go to school on Monday and sit down with your black friends and your white friends and talk about <laughs> what you watched on television. So what we're finding with our Funky Turns 40 Black Character Revolution exhibition, which takes 60 pieces of animation from our collection and is touring to museums, is we're getting a multicultural audience. Yes. I mean, you know, parents, whether mm -hmm. they're black, white, Hispanic, are bringing their kids. They're talking about what they watched. Mm. You know, their grandparents are bringing their grandchildren. Children are learning about, um, if they haven't seen these things in syndication or reruns, kind of what animation was like uh, back then, and then they talk about what they like, so it, it's a Funky really- turns 40? Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting a um, audience and interesting response, very great you know, response that we've received from uh, we Do the coins, could we do Jackie sure. Robinson? Uh, my mom, who watches one-on-one -on -one every night, loves the Brooklyn Dodgers, and her favorite was always, uh, it was either Pee Wee Reese or Jackie Robinson, and she chose Jackie. So this is the Jackie Robinson uh, legacy set. Uh, it was issued in 1997. We have the original patch wow. that was worn by the Major League uh, Baseball players. It's a replica the of the patch that was worn. Uh, this is the a replica of the Topps card that was issued. In 1947. In 19... When he broke uh, the color yes, line. yes. And this is the, if I can get it out, the $5 gold coin wow. that was issued as a commemorative coin. And here we also have a replica. It's a lapel pin. Uh, having a little difficulty getting it That's out. That's right, it's a lapel pin that. And it is a replica of the. Um... Hold it just like this. I oh, got it. Bob, you got this, buddy? Describe it, go ahead. It's a uh, lapel pin that uh, signifies the 50th anniversary of him breaking the color barrier in Major League Baseball. It's good stuff. And describe this one. Um, and this Marian is Anderson. actually um, a Marian Anderson uh, bronze medal. Tell everyone uh, who Marian Anderson was, why so important. Well, Marian Anderson was, you know, um, a great civil rights um, icon, and she was the first black person, the first black woman to be honored by receiving a, congress a congressional gold medal. Um, which is one of the highest honors that you can receive from mm. the United States government. And everyone who is honored with a Congressional Gold Medal um, has their likeness um, replicated on a, uh, a commemorative bronze uh, medal. So we collect the commem commemorative medals of all of the uh, black history icons from Marian Anderson to you know, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, all of the you know, real um, you know, significant uh, leaders from the, from the civil rights movement are, so, have been honored. So you go from Jackie Robinson, Marian Anderson, mm -hmm. to the black exploitation, if you will. Yes. You know, not Shaft. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. John Shaft. A huge fan of the, the, the genre, huge fan of the, the movies. Um, 
And when I got There's Superfly right there, Superfly, the Mac yeah. Shaft. Uh, Hold on, Jen Eichlin is right there, executive producer. I'll give you the year, 1973. Right? Not even born. So, so <laughs> how about for people like our younger producers, if you will, here in public broadcast? They're like, what are you talking about? What about them? How do we pull them in? Well, if you're a fan of hip hop and you know the history of hip hop, you know hip hop was really based in 1970s uh, uh, black culture. That's right. And also, a lot of the rappers got their identity from these films. So, again, if you're a huge fan of hip hop, that's really the foundation of hip hop. Right. And when you look at these films, you kind of make the uh, assessment where someone like a Snoop Dogg, where right. he gets his character of being. A pimp. Yes. He and wasn't the first. No, yeah. he no. wasn't the first. <laughs> and you, you can see how they've incorporated into who they I, are. I got it. 1978. Boy, am I dating myself. Uh, I'm a kid. Car wash. Mean anything? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, just, I just threw yes. that out. You got it's that. Iconic oh movies, Oh, my God. Iconic I, soundtrack. So the films were great. The soundtrack was oh, great. Okay. Even music better. Was terrific. Okay, I hate to do that. Because 30 seconds left. Where can people find... The Museum of Uncut Funk is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day at museumofuncutfunk.com. Say it again, the museum? Museumofuncutfunk.com. This is, a, you, you love what you do. Yes, yes we this do. This is your passion. This yes. is our obsession. You, let me tell you something, you said obsession. Yes. Some obsessions are unhealthy <laughs> and bad for you. This is good for you. This is yes. a funky obsession. Thank, both of you. thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm obsessed much. too. <laughs> Can I get in the club? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Anytime, anytime, anytime. Thank that you. That was great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the Newark Museum, in cooperation with NJTV, and 13 for WNET. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at Newark Museum has been provided by Bank of America, PSE&G, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, The Fidelco Group, Johnson & Johnson, Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, and by Barnabas Health. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone.